Okay, and we hope you stay for fellowship. Well, I want to share with you this morning a section of Scripture that talks about the great promise of eternal life that, that God gives to us. And though the, the latter part of Revelation always paints the picture of what the new heaven and the new earth will be like, I think it also gives us a very good picture of, of what heaven is like right now. So let me share that with you right now. Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, and yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Let's pray. Oh Lord, I imagine every person here to some extent knows the pain of death and the sorrow and loss that comes with that. And yet I hope and believe that every person here also knows the hope of heaven. The feeling of God wrapping his arms around them even in their tears and the promises of the future and the best that is yet to be flowing into the heart and the mind, even as it is still okay and it is still natural. And in fact, it is right to have a time of mourning. And even after that initial time of mourning, there's other times where sounds or thoughts or things will come into our mind, and we just have an overwhelming missing of that loved one and an overwhelming sense that planet Earth is not the final answer, but there is something better to be in the kingdom of heaven. Oh God, may that reminder be with us. May it carry us. May it be the center of our hearts. We ask this and we pray this, oh God, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may all of God's people say, Amen. How many of you have ever lost someone you loved? You know, I've discovered something over the years that no matter how much I think I'm prepared to say goodbye to someone, at the moment and in the days after, I find I'm never quite as prepared as I, as I thought I was. And the sorrow that I will feel, the, 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 the tears that will flow, sometimes a couple days after the funeral, because, you know, as a pastor, you've got to go into pastor mode when that happens. But it's when everyone goes home and the tasks of the funeral are done that you are left with your thoughts. And you realize that folks become a part of your family, even if they're not of the same bloodline because you're connected by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you deal, even in your faith, you deal with the sorrow of loss. But yet there's this hope. And the older I get, I have to admit two things. The sorrow maybe gets a little tougher, but the hope grows more and more and more in the promise of eternal life. And the thought that every day I'm one day closer to that day of the great reunion, that just fills me with hope. Even on days when it's, I'm also filled with sorrow over the loss of someone. Well, Jesus speaks to us through the book of Revelation, and he, and he talks to us about a promise that is given to us because of his death and resurrection. You see, it's a promise that he himself can say this is true and this is for sure. And in fact, this is why I bore the cross. 
in the beating and the scourging and death so that you might have eternal life and that you might know the hope of reunion until the time that reunion becomes absolutely experienced. And so Jesus says this to the people that belong to him, that are his followers, that he's been, that he has redeemed. He makes a promise. He's going to transport us from death and disease, from injustice, from poverty, from violence, from immorality, from separation itself. Any of us frustrated with any of those things today? And, and because I had to make it fit on the first slide, I had to skip a whole bunch of stuff. I had a, really a long list but I guess these were my tops that I came up with. Because there's something inside of us that desires a place of justice, desires a place of hope, desires a place where there's, where there's no more poverty, no more war, no more unfairness, no more death, no more disease, no more saying goodbye. And I don't think it's by accident that we have this longing. I, I think, as a matter of fact, we talk about this on Wednesday nights, I think somebody's programmed us. I think somebody's put that longing in us to draw us toward that hope and to keep reminding us you were made for somewhere else and the best is yet to be. Therefore, the gift of Jesus Christ must be so vital in our lives. And so Christ promises to transport his followers from death and disease and injustice and poverty and violence and immorality and separation to a place where those things do not exist anymore. I love the description of heaven. It's called, there's a, there's a place where the river of life runs from the throne of God and the Lamb. And, and think about this, to, to people in Jesus' time, this would be even more meaningful than it might be to us today because they lived day to day, they didn't have indoor plumbing, a lot of them lived in a very arid desert type of, of culture. And what do you need? What's one element that we need for sure if there's going to be life? We need what? Water. So the idea here that you don't have to go dig your well and hope for the best, or that as you, you wander around the desert, you better make sure you got enough water with you. The promise here that there will be a river of, of life that is crystal clear is, is a promise of not only something that's beautiful, but it's a promise that God's taking care of everything. And those, those worries and those anxieties over the things that lead to death are no more. And so we're invited to drink from the living water, as Jesus called himself in, John, in the Gospel of John. And we're, we have this picture of this water of life that's accessible to give us life. And then the next thing he says that's in the kingdom of heaven is the very presence of the throne of God and the Lamb. You know where, the God, where God and the Lamb is? There's no evil, there's no incompleteness, there's no, no campaign commercials. Is perfect. It is to be in the actual presence of God. How many of you have from time to time have ever said, boy, I'd like to ask God this question. Yeah. Guess what? I bet you can. Because he's present with us. He has wiped away every tear from the eyes of those that have entered into this place. And God himself is present with us. And where God is present with us, there can be no evil, there can be no injustice, no corruption, no yuck. Just God and his kingdom and love and restoration. And then he talks about that in this place, there's the tree of life. And the description is, it's fruit that is constantly blooming. You'll notice there's, there's new fruit every month. It's the idea of this, this completeness of God, that God taking care of everything. And then he adds to it that the leaves, a lot of times when I was younger, I thought the fruit was this part. No, it's the leaves are for the healing of what? The nations. Physical healing, no more disease. Emotional healing, no more feeling the burden of the emotions and stress of this life. Physical healing. No more limping around with all of our ailments. Mental healing. Well, I'll leave that one for all of us, okay? 
and spiritual healing. The fulfillment of what we know we've always been called to be and, and to take part in. And then add to it the healing of the nations. No more nations arguing with each other and cursing each other and firing off missiles as testing. No more videos coming into our living rooms of people being assaulted and knocked off platforms in subway stations. Healing and unity, finally, among peoples. And you know how long this is going to last? Forever and ever. No more despots, no more dictators. No more secret meetings. Peace. Jesus goes on in his description here. There will be no more curse of any kind. The curse will be gone. The evil will be removed. His people will be there, and they will see his face. So as we said upon the altar, they will see his face. God will be present there. The completeness of God will be there. But don't miss this, this first part. Because his people will be there to see his face, what does that tell us about his people? Not only will we be before God, but what, what will we be to each other? Together. And I don't know how all the timing, and I don't know what we do in heaven completely. There's, there's so many descriptions, and there's so much, much yet to find out. I don't know if you, you sit by his, his throne and, and sing all the time, or if there's guard. I, I don't know all the stuff. All I know that where God is, there's a completeness of joy. And then where God gathers his people, there's got to be a hug line, right? There's got to be a greeting each other again. A tear of joy as we're unified again with those that we miss. And he says his name will be upon them. This is the sign, I believe, of the adoption of Jesus Christ. Remember he says, uh, those who are, are, are with me and not ashamed of me, I will not be ashamed of them before my fathers in heaven when we stand before the Father. But those that are ashamed of me, the Son of Man will be ashamed of you. A, a denying, I didn't know you. So, Who's here? Those that have received the name of Christ upon them in his redemption. His name, his full adoption will be completely appreciated and known that through Jesus Christ we have eternal life. And then he goes on with this. Night shall be no more. Why, why is that significant? There isn't going to be darkness anymore. What happens in the darkness? Bad things, right? Crime and all sorts of corruption happen in the darkness. No more of that. Because where he is, God himself will be the light all the time. There will not be even a centimeter, even a millimeter for there to be corruption and evil and darkness. It'll be light. And this reunion, this coming into the presence of God, how long is it going to go on? Forever and ever. Never having to say, Goodbye again. Does that sound good to anybody? And that is at the very heart of our faith that this promise awaits us no matter what. No matter how now we find our bodies breaking down. Anybody in here find their body breaking down? There'll be restoration in the kingdom of heaven forever and ever. You know, a lot of different Christians have written about the joy of heaven. I want to just share a few of the promises with you that the people have written. Augustine, St. Augustine said this, our hearts do not rest until they rest in what? God. And when do they rest completely in God? When do they rest completely in God? In the kingdom of heaven. We find peace now in him, in his presence, but they rest with him when they're with him in heaven. Listen to what St. Paul said. Whoops. Get back. Hello. There. To be absent from the body is what? To be present with the Lord. And Jesus said, you know, I'll come back and I will take you there myself. For where I am, there you may also be. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. Now this next one by Thomas More, an Irish writer. I, I love this one. Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. The truth is there are some sorrows we deal with here on, on earth that will never be healed. 
those fractures, that missing, whatever it may be, those, those may always exist here on planet Earth. But in heaven, what happens? It's all healed. It's all taken care of. There's the presence of God and beautiful peace and reunion with people. So the, the goal of heaven, the design of heaven is to heal those things also that cannot be healed here. Then the dying word of one of the Methodist founders, Charles Wesley, he says this. He said this upon his deathbed. It, it's noted these were, were probably the last words that Charles Wesley said. I shall be satisfied, satisfied, satif- satisfied when I awake in thy likeness. And then John Bunyan. Anybody read Pilgrim's Progress? These were supposed to be possibly his last words or maybe his last lucid words. Weep not for me, but for yourselves. I go to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will through the mediation of his blessed Son receive me, though I am a sinner. There we shall meet to sing the new song and remain everlastingly happy, world without end. And then finally, C.S. Lewis, one of my heroes, says this. A continually, a continual looking forward to the eternal world is not a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. What does that mean? Well, Lewis in his day there were people that said the only reason people believe in life after death is because they're too psychologically weak to be able to hold on to the fact that you just end. C.S. Lewis said so many things about heaven and about death and what we look forward to. But this that he says here, is, it's an argument against the, the rationalists that say you can't, you know, you, you just think about this stuff because you're weak. He said the reason we think about this is because we were designed to think about this. The reason we hope in this is because we were designed to hope in this. The reason we long for this is because we were created not for the temporal, we were created for the eternal. And it is God's deep desire, and has always been God's deep desire, to be in relationship with us now so that he may be in relationship with us forever in the kingdom of heaven. This is not human frailty, mental illness that thinks about this stuff. This is the design of the one who lives and reigns forever and ever who says, child, I want you to know you're mine. And I want you to know there's a place of peace and love and joy and kindness and reunion where the victorious in Christ gather And they see each other again. You were designed to think about this. A number of years ago, and some of you may have heard this story before. You ever heard the story about the fork? Anybody? Okay, Barb, don't let it out of the bag, okay? Okay. A woman who discovered that she was terminally ill found out how much time she had left, and she started the process of preparing for her death and the planning of the funeral and so on. And so, as would be part of that, she called her young pastor over to come and talk to her about her final wishes. And in the process, the pastor shows up, and she has a list for him. She has the scriptures she would like read. She's got the songs that she would like sung. She's got the dress even picked out that she wants to wear in the casket. She has the Bible that she wants to be buried with in her right hand. And so the pastor's getting all these instructions and writing them down, and and it seemed like the conversation was over, and he got up to put his jacket on, and as he gets up to put his jacket on, she says, oh, one last thing, pastor. In my right hand, I want my Bible. In my left hand, I want a fork. You can imagine the pastor was a bit perplexed by this. And, you know, sometimes we just roll with the punches and don't ask questions, but other times we're just 
got to know why. And she said, he looks at a fork? And she said, yeah. And this is why. Whenever we gather at family or church dinners, we have, you know, the salad, we have the, the main course, the entree, the meat, the potatoes, the vegetables. And then when everything is being cleaned up, all the plates are going to the kitchen, everything's being put away, the host or hostess says to us one thing, they say, hold on to your what? Forks. And why would you hold on to your fork? You can take it home with you? No. Because, hold on to your fork because dessert's about to be served. And she said, this was always my favorite part about any church meal or any family meal, that I was going to get chocolate cake, I was going to get pie, I was going to get something fantastic, cheesecake. And so, when people see me holding the fork, I want you to remind them that I'm holding the fork because I knew the best was yet to come. I'm going home to the place that I was made for. So when you see a fork, and I'm going to, to all those that we're honoring today for their family, I'm going to attempt to give you all a fork. You're going to get a beautiful flower in a moment, which is like classy. And of course, the pastor's giving you a plastic fork. Fits my personality. The rose is a reminder of how beautiful God is. The fork is a reminder of what God does. The best in Jesus Christ is yet to come. Let's pray. Oh Lord, I thank you so much that even in our humanness, even in the pain of loss, we are constantly reminded that the best is yet to be. Help us, O oh God, to hold on to these promises. Help us to long and look for that day when we, we shall be home. And help us, O oh God, to not only hold on, hold on to our faith for ourselves, but help us to share it with others. For there's others that are wondering the same thing. Is there heaven? And what is it like? How do I get there? Oh God, help us to share that the best is yet to be. We ask this and we pray this now in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And may all of God's people say, Amen. I'm going to ask those folks that we're going to